Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics, and today I'm going to be talking about audio sidechain ducking by using an FX grid device, uh, specifically a, a kind of precision audio sidechain ducker that I've made to deal with some problems that Bitwig has with audio ducking. Uh, it's kind of a long story. We've had uh, a couple days worth of scientific discussion over in the Bitwig Discord. Uh, a lot of experimentation, a lot of ideas. So this isn't all my own invention. Uh, this is based on a lot of feedback and comments of earlier attempts to solve this problem. But there's a general problem with Bitwig in that if you're using its, let's turn this on and show you. If you're using the modulator that's called audio sidechain or the modulator called note sidechain, Sorry, let me turn that on for you. Let's just do it that way, it's always easier. Note sidechain and audio sidechain as modulators can work really, really well when they're used inside of a Bitwig instrument or inside of a device. Um, like if I had a, you know, any old Bitwig device such as, mm, Blur, right? And if for some reason I wanted to put an audio sidechain in here and tell the audio sidechain to pick up something like my kick impulse that I've got over here and basically say, you know, use this modulator based on the impulse from the kick, I want you to duck the mix, right? Every time the kick hits. If you use audio sidechain or note sidechain over here, if you use either of those in this kind of context, they work great. Their timing is perfect um, and they work as you would expect. And you can use in the audio sidechain, for example, you can filter the specific frequency range that you want to be the, the captured detection impulse, the click to trigger the sidechain behavior. And it just it works well. You can adjust the attack and release envelope and get the kind of shape you want. So audio sidechain and note sidechain are good and work perfectly in certain contexts. But there's a context we all often reach for thinking, well, it works great in these contexts, so let's use it in a different context. And the problem arises when, for example, I have a signal like this. Uh, this is just a white noise track here. And I want to say duck this to a kick. And let's pretend this was a subtrack. But I tend to use white noise because it helps me visualize and, and, and debug and test envelopes sometimes for things. White noise is a really good way to see the shape of different settings. So <clears throat> if I wanted to just put on here a simple tool, well, tool's problematic, but we'll start with tool because it's simplest. So tool is, is Bitwig's equivalent to utility in Ableton Live. Problem is, right up through Live 9, utility would only go down to like negative 48 dB. It wouldn't duck all the way to a negative infinity, so it was terrible to use it for volume automation or ducking because you couldn't go all the way to the floor at negative infinity. And they didn't fix that until Live 10. And now Tool in Live 10 can go all the way to infinity, but I'm sorry, Utility in Live 10 can go all the way to negative infinity. But unfortunately, in Bitwig, we're still stuck with Tool only going down as far as negative 36 dB. So really, instead of using Tool to do audio ducking, uh, a, a lot of us, and I've certainly done this, we would reach for a different product like uh, this is Melda Utility, M Utility, which is a free plugin from Melda. And the nice thing about Melda is it goes all the way down to full silence, to, to negative infinity, right? It goes all the way to the floor. So in the past, I have been using M Utility. I just wouldn't think about it. I would drop M Utility on an audio track like this. And then I would set up an audio sidechain. Let me activate this. I would set up an audio sidechain and feed a kick or something into it, and I would use something like this to try to do audio ducking. 
And I never really looked close at the results. I never really, really like stopped and, and looked in close, you know, at a high resolution of the resulting, you know, I never bounced the audio and looked at it. I just assumed the timing was right. But it turns out Bitwig right now has a serious bug. A lot of us think this is a serious bug because if you try to use audio sidechain in this context where you're modulating an audio signal against something like Tool, or, or a third-party VST like MUtility, there's, it's not taking into account the, um, the global uh, delay compensation. The, um, uh, so it's not, it, it's not handling lag correctly when you have lag from various uh, VSTs or devices that are incurring a certain amount of lag on a channel. The global uh, PDC uh, plug-in delay compensation is not correctly factored in when you use audio sidechain in this way. So until the Bitwig devs admit that there's a problem here and fix it, you can't really get away with this approach to do audio ducking in a simple intuitive way. You would just think, I'll just reach for audio sidechain, I'll modulate something like volume and I'm done, right? But it doesn't work. So we'll, we'll circle back around to this and I'll show you how bad it is because it's really bad. But first I wanna show you kind of the right way to get it done and a precise way to get it done that doesn't have any kind of lag. So let me deactivate this and let me deactivate this so that they're not interfering with anything. So what I have now on this original white noise track is a single FX grid device that I've built that looks like this. We're gonna talk about this in more detail in a second. But first I wanna show you some snapshotted results from some bounces at different settings. And what I'm trying to demonstrate here is I have a, a fairly typical kick. Kicks are weird beasts because they're long and they have separate well-defined phases, like right up through about where my cursor is here is the transient phase. And this, this can be as long as 20 or 30 or even 40 milliseconds long, right? And then the fat body phase comes in, right? And this is where you get your boom and your, your punch and your sub feel from a kick, right? And then at some point, you kind of hit the tail phase in here, and these are all really far apart you know, 20 to 30 milliseconds for this part, maybe as long as 80 milliseconds to get through the body, maybe even longer in a big 808. And then the decay phase or the tail phase that you typically don't want to factor into a duck against something like a sub or a bass sound, um, you know, the tail phase can go on for a long time. So this is a really typical kick. It's a really long kick. And usually what you want to duck against is the transient phase, right, from about here to here. And if you look at this segment that I've highlighted, I'm zoomed in pretty close. I'm down to a 1 1 28th note. Uh, you can see that with different settings of this, this FX grid device, which again, I'll talk about in a minute, with different settings, you can get totally different types of actual resulting ducking shapes, okay? Like this, this row here is a really clean, precise duck. Like I would usually set up on a subtrack, it almost instantly, cuts off, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a attack ramp or attack slope, right? Right, right here. Tiny bit of an attack slope, but, it, but it, it, it decays really, really fast. I mean, that's just milliseconds. Humans don't perceive that. And it actually is smoothed slightly, so it's not as likely to click if it's coming in right in the middle of a sub waveform that's way away from the zero line. Okay, so you typically want a tiny bit of overshoot like that, a tiny bit of attack like you're seeing there. And then it basically ducks all the way to the floor for most of the transient. And then as the transient's starting to pull out, well, yeah, that's still the transient. You can see there's some spiky like look and feel here to the sine wave. So this is still transient. This is the sharpest part of the transient, but this is still high frequency transient. We've still got high frequency transient here. And then we really don't start getting into the body until about right here when these sine waves start becoming relatively smooth, although that's, a, that's an odd looking kick. That's got some, 
that's a really heavily like clipped kick, but that's okay. That gives the body part of its sound, probably gives it a nice sharp sound. So um, you can see that this is lining up pretty well with the transient, the first part of the transient. And then as we start moving into the body, you know, the release slope from the duck is ramping up a little bit here. And then as we hit the full meat of the body where the biggest boom part of this kick is, you know, we're still pulling up gradually to right about here when the tail section starts, we have pretty much full signal again, okay? So this is kind of the ducking shape you want. And I could have made this, this part come up even faster by uh, setting my release to more like one millisecond or even less than one millisecond. This is a five millisecond release on my, on my grid device. Um, but the point is, this is usually what you're looking for. Kick snaps out the sub during the transient, starts coming back in as, as the body of the kick uh, is, is swelling in. But, you know, in some cases, depending, if you really want to, if you want the, the kick body to always win out over the sub, you might instead set up an even longer kind of release on the duck. Like this, this track here is a much longer release, and you can see that you know, as the body starts, it's still almost like at the floor on the original signal. Pretend this is a sub instead of white noise, right? And then, you know, most of the body's ringing out and it's still barely starting to let the sub come back. And then as we start moving into the tail phase, the sub finally starts, you know, blending and crossfading up, upward as the tail decays out. And then as you get to about here-ish, yeah, right about here, you're back up to full signal on the sub again. So, you know, quite often, if you want the kick to win, if you want the kick to be your dominant low-end pulse that hits your body and makes the dancers need to move, right? Typically, you want to take those sustained or... or um, the sub is too sustained often to to make the body want to move. So a lot of times uh, EDM producers will let the kick win and they want that kick body to be the bump, 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 regardless of what the sub itself is doing at the same time. And so you can see over here, I got this shape by picking a 30 millisecond fall on the kick, which again, 30 milliseconds is typically this length of the transient phase. And it just works out that um, the way that, you know, a 30 millisecond fall also slows down the recovery a little bit so that, you know, you get this nice cross fading up of the sub after, you know, a good portion of the kick body has had a chance to really dominate and boom. But it's not a hard gated swap between the two sounds. It's a nice kind of cross-fading blending that keeps the total energy on the low end where you want it for mastering and mixing, okay? Uh, next up, we have an example of two... It's the same exact uh, device, the same exact sounds, but you'll notice we have this crappy-looking attack phase here where it's taking way too long to duck down to zero. Right? There's, there's a noticeable uh, attack slope or attack kind of a curve. And this is happening because of where and how I filtered the detection signal or the trigger signal from the kick itself. And this is the other part that's tricky. Uh, in a kick, especially, the transient portion is a very high frequency sound, way, way up near, you know, above 10 kilohertz probably close to 20 kilohertz, um, maybe even higher than 20 kilohertz, honestly. It can be very, very sharp and white noisy and high, high frequency, right? And so if you do your filter of that kick at a very high frequency, like these were both made with my f a, a bandpass filter up at about 22 kilohertz, that's how you make sure that it's the transient that triggers the duck, and that's how you get a clean duck. But these two tracks down here were set up with the, the detection filter on the kick down around 8 kilohertz, right? Now, you think 8's pretty high, but it's not. 8 is kind of 
where the, the main clicky sound of the body is, right? The body itself is way down in the sub range and, and the 100 to 200 range, and that's where your thud and your boom is. But the sharp, clicky type sound that you can, you can base a ducking transient on for the body is more in this range of eight kilohertz. So you can see that if you set your, your filtering detection range wrong, your, your duck's gonna take too long to really kick in. It's not really kicking in until the body starts, right? That's why you see it go to zero way over here instead of over here where it should be. That's transient and this is kind of the body and the filtering range is different. So with this in mind, just keep this in mind and we'll come back and look at it occasionally. Let me show you how this device actually works. I basically built my own sidechain ducker inside the grid, and this is this is kind of a theme I'm doing currently with the grid. I'm going to eventually start doing videos that are like a basic boot camp of of basic design patterns, like how to how to wrap your head around the grid and how to build things in the grid. But right now, uh, the last video I did about the last two videos I did about hocketing, like building hocketing machines in the grid, and now this one. My focus is often on solving specific problems that the DAW itself can't solve or that external third-party VSTs can't solve, right? So I have a problem. The problem is Bitwig's most intuitive approach to doing simple audio sidechain ducking of any kind of audio is a little imprecise. And again, I will circle back and show you that. But I'm trying to be conscious of people who think I go too long in my videos and don't appreciate all the detail I go into. So I'm trying to do the summary first. Um, so the way this ducker works is, you know, here's my input of the original sub or white noise or whatever's on the track. And it basically just rolls through a uh, gain to volume fader that can go all the way down to negative infinity or way up to plus 18, okay? Uh, and I'm just modulating this with this value right here uh, eventually gets around to modulating this. Uh, and we'll talk about how we get to that point. But So I got my signal coming in. I have a, a volume knob that'll go all the way to negative infinity, I'm modulating it downwards with the trigger signal. And then uh, ignore the select for a second. Then it basically just feeds into the output of the track. So this white noise that you see, right? is just passing through unimpeded until the kick hits. And then it's detecting this kick and it's doing the duck. And, the, and, and that's, that's what's going on here. All right, uh, ignore the select for now. Let's talk about what's, what's going on here. We have an, we have an input. Uh, this is a device that is called audio sidechain. It's part of the IO section and Unlike the audio sidechain device, which is, has averaging built into it, again, if I were to enable this, or activate it rather, and you look at it, you can see it's got attack and release smoothing behavior built into it. So it's like pulling in a signal and it has a built-in envelope follower, right? So that's what they call the audio sidechain modulator. Um, but in the grid, the audio sidechain device is just a tap. It doesn't have any follower detection built into it. It doesn't have any kind of envelope following. It's just give me a signal from somewhere else. It's like a virtual patch cable. So that's something to remember. And I, I changed the name of it to trigger signal for this build, but it's, it's basically the thing called audio sidechain right here. Okay, so I'm pulling in the signal uh, from a different track again. It could be a different track entirely, or it could be a chain or a layer. You can pull signals from anywhere in Bitwig. It's very flexible with its routing. Um, and then I'm running that signal through a detection filter. This is, this is just, uh, I guess I'll leave this open for now. This is just the SVF filter, right? And I renamed it to detection filter just to make clear what it is in this context. And the thing about the SVF filter is it's one of the few filter types we have in the grid right now that lets you choose between low pass, band pass, or high pass. And typically for sidechain detection, you want a band pass. Uh, if you're used to using Ableton Live Compressor to do sidechain ducking, 
against kicks and snares, you always open that filter section and you always pick the bandpass shape, right? And then you sweep around to find the best click sound to trigger the side chain. And, and that's exactly what we're doing here. It's exactly the same. Uh, then we're, depending on how quiet or loud this signal is, we're using some gain to, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and trigger this and let it start playing. So there's the kick sound from the other track. And the reason we're hearing that is because I have this button that's toggling a, a solo to, to hear the filter, right? Uh, we're not hearing, this is sit sitting on, this whole device is sitting on this white noise track. And if I, if I were to turn this button off, we'd hear the white noise instead, and then the effect of the ducking on the white noise. But I don't wanna hear that right now. I just wanna hear this, the actual kick itself. So as we uh, listen to the kick, you'll see that one of the things I'm trying to do is make sure that the, the post filter signal is as strong as possible. So I'm using this VU meter to kind of do a first quick level setting and try and get the VU meter peaking really near the top because I want a strong, sharp signal that's, that's full almost up to zero dBFS, right? Almost to the ceiling. Um, and then as we move the filter around, you can hear that we're picking up different parts of this spectrum. This is showing the whole kicks spectrum. And right now, basically what I'm picking up for the filter is way up here, like way up here. This is where I'm, I'm detecting. But if I turn this down, right? we're picking increasingly lower parts of the sub as our detection. And see if, if for some reason I wanted to trigger on this low body area, I would probably wanna turn this gain up to get a nice sharp signal for, for the actual duck itself, right? So that's what's going on here. Um, let's push this back up where it was. But since I want the transient, I'm filtering, I'm using this bandpass to filter just this highest portion right here. And that gets us where we wanna go. Let me take this down a notch. Well, let me do a shift. All right. So the next thing that's happening is I'm using an envelope shaper. And that's over here in the envelope section. I'm sorry, the envelope follower. That's what it normally looks like. But I, again, I made the, a name change to make it more clear. Uh, this is just adjusting the, the shape of the ducking slice, right? It's, it's just an envelope, right? Rise is essentially your attack time and fall is essentially your release time. And they have a little graph in here that's helpful, but I find it's not very precise. So quite often when I'm playing with the envelope follower, uh, I will often just add an oscilloscope to see it more precisely and clearly. Like, let me play this kick for a second and notice how the, the peaky shapes you see in here that are roughly the shape we're getting with these settings, like this is a 30 millisecond release time right now. Um, the shape we're getting, you'll see it like some peaks are higher, some peaks are lower, and that makes it seem like something's wrong. But if you look over here, the peaks are exactly the same height and they're, they're exactly where I want them, which is right near the top, almost zero dBFS, right? So watch. See how that one was higher? That's lower, that's higher, that's lower. It looks like something's weird, right? But if you look over here, they're identical all the way through. So the moral of the story is this little display is a bit inaccurate. It just gives you a rough idea. Now, as I push the fall up, I can get a longer release slope, right? As I pull the fall down, I can make that a really tiny slice right on the transient. And you'll notice right here, we're at about the three to five millisecond range. If I go down to, you know, sub one millisecond, we still just have this, this tick. It's a tick tick and it, and it releases almost instantly, okay? So this is what you use to set effectively the, the release. So you're getting as tight of a duck as you want, but um, you're getting as tight and narrow and short of a duck as you want, but you're also getting a little bit of curve on the release so that you don't have clicks when it just jumps back up to maximum, especially in the middle of something like a sub signal where you might be jumping back 
in the middle of a very high positive value or negative value and not, not around zero, uh, a zero crossing. Okay, and then finally, this attenuate section is just, you know, this is the shaping and then this is how heavy you want the duct to be. So assuming we have this slice, if I don't want it going all the way to the floor, like if it goes all the way, if the peak is going all the way to the top here, that's going to duck the original white noise all the way down to the floor, like you see here. You know, that's, that's at floor. Um, if you don't want it going down that far, you can instead use this attenuate knob to just dial it back and then you can see the resulting shape in this oscilloscope. So if we want less of a duck, we do that. Or if we want even less of a duck, we do that and so on, okay? So that's all this uh, attenuate's doing. So the basic idea here should be pretty clear by now. Trigger signal, filter it, find the place that has the actual transient we wanna trigger the duck on. That's what the filter is for. Use the filter solo to, to help you hear that, as well as these meters to help you see it and find it. And then um, adjust your release time. And you almost never wanna make the rise faster. You don't want an attack on a duck. You, want, you usually want an attack on a duck to be as sharp as possible. And by default, even when it's on its minimum value, which is one-tenth of a millisecond, effectively, as, as you can see by, by zooming in here, this is, this is a, well, this is a, yeah, this is still a one millisecond attack. But if I zoom in, you'll see there's still a tiny short amount of a, of a fall. There's a slope there. So it's got a little bit of baked in safety to it, even though at a normal resolution of like one thirty second note or whatever, this is going to look almost flat line like a brick wall, right? But most most DAW designers and plugin designers won't let you actually brick wall slope or brick wall gate something. I mean, even if you use Gatekeeper or LFO tool and do hard gates or auto pan and live to do hard gates, that kind of thing, you still end up with a little bit of a smoothing here to prevent clicks because people would complain about clicks if they didn't. So I think the built-in smoothing is already perfect on the... Um, on the envelope follower module, at a, at a minimum value, you still have an, enough smoothing to prevent clicks. And, and so I would recommend you almost never change the rise because here's what happens if you change the rise. I'm gonna creep it up and you would think that what it would do is make this first vertical line just tilt over to the right and get longer. But watch what happens. As I push it up, you're not seeing it get any appreciably longer. You're just seeing the entire height of the duck getting less and less. And it isn't until I push this to really long times that you start seeing a little bit of an actual slope on the attack. Like, like right there, you can see there's a noticeable slope now. And that's at about, uh, what, 40 milliseconds. But the problem is, for a short transient signal like a kick, well, there's no volume left to actually, like, trigger anything with. So that's why you don't usually want to mess with this rise. You usually want to just leave it cranked all the way over left. Just use the fall to get the tightness or width of your duck, the shape of your duck, how much release it is, and so on. And then um, use the attenuate to adjust how strong you want it to be in the final output. And then, you know, the final attenuated result is what's being used over here you can see when I hold it, how far back it's kicking this gain knob, right? If I don't attenuate it at all, it's taking the gain. It's so fast. Here, let me, let me kick on the fall a little bit. Now you can see it going all the way to the bottom, right? Right here. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, now I'll go talk about the problems with the, uh, with the lag and the, and the global plug-in delay compensation. And, and the problem with audio, audio sidechain and note sidechain. Uh, let me show you, let me think one more thing here. I'm gonna turn off the, the solo of this filter uh, so you can hear what it's actually doing to the white noise signal. But before I do that, I need to turn the volume way the hell down or I'm gonna blow your ears out with this white noise. Okay, so let's go back in here and now we're hearing the white noise. 
And let me go turn up the white noise until you can hear the duck. And then if we bring in the duck kick too, let's see, I'm gonna drop that down just in case it's really loud. Oops. Okay, not too bad. I'm gonna take it up to full volume. Okay, so that's it. If you want this device uh, to tuck away in your preset folder for when the production release of Bitwig 3.0 comes out, you can, in the description for this video, you'll find a link to the Bitwig Discord. And uh, in the resources section, I'm sorry, not the resources section, in the your preset section, uh, this is typically where a lot of us drop the presets that we've been building as we go. So you can come in here and look for this date stamp and find it here, or you can just rebuild it from my video. It's a good learning experience to build your own presets. So give that a try if you want. Uh, so if you want to stick around, let me show you the actual problem with the uh, regular audio sidechain ducking behavior. I'm going to go ahead and disable the grid. And we're gonna use, instead of the kick this time, I'm gonna scroll out and scroll over to where, uh, I'm also gonna get rid of all these. I'll just deactivate them. Okay, way over here at the beginning of the kick, I have some different impulses. Let's zoom in and take a look at them. These are some incredibly short impulses some people might use as click triggers, right? So this is just a hi-hat that's super short, and then it's faded to be even shorter. So it's this tiny, tiny short impulse. Look at how far I'm zoomed in. One 2048th of a note, <laughs> okay, of, of a beat. So that's a really short signal. Here's a slightly longer signal, but it's the same deal. It's a hi-hat, just longer, still faded so that, you know, it's a pretty steep, sharp transient. And then over here, I have the full hi-hat, right? Which is still pretty short. I mean, I'm zoomed in at 1 28th of a grid. Um, so, you know, sometimes we want some really tight precision with our ducking. If you're using tiny little bleeps and bloops and clicks and, and weird high-pitched staticky stuff way above 10K. Yeah, we do that sometimes. So uh, here's the problem. Let's see how these react when we use various types of ducking on them. And most importantly, let's see how they react when we have various things in the project that are creating some delay compensation, some lag. Like over here in the master, I'm currently using a tool device. I'm sorry, a peak limiter device because, you know, I think that's just basic hygiene. Keep a peak limiter on your master at all times so you don't accidentally blow your speakers or your ears out. Um, so the problem is the peak limiter, to do its job well, it incurs about 1.5 milliseconds of lag, right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna turn the peak limiter off. I'm gonna deactivate it entirely. And remember from my earlier videos, Bitwig is awesome because when you deactivate a plugin, all the memory is released, all the lag is removed, and all the CPU hit is removed, right? It's way better than Ableton in this regard. Ableton will remove the CPU hit, but it won't remove the plug-in delay compensation lag, and it won't release the memory, okay? So Bitwig wins when it comes to playing games with your, your resource usage and your CPU and freeing things up for your CPU. So all I've done is deactivated the peak limiter, and if I do a bounce of this track now with something like, uh, let's do it with, all right. We're gonna do it with the, the smart way that everyone has been doing it, right? Instead of using M utility, let me explain what this thing is here. This, this is kind of a tricky little workaround. This is an FX layer device. It's as if I had come in here and said, you know, give me layer, 
bring in the FX layer. And normally we use this to layer in a bunch of VSTs in different chains. And then they're all running in parallel with whatever signal's running through this layer device. And then you can mix between the full dry signal or the full uh, sum of all the FX chains that are in here with different kinds of processing devices where you can do a 50-50 balance where there's you know equal amounts of both. So the thing is, if you if you leave this empty, or if you put in some dummy item like a, a tool, let me scroll over here. If you put in something like tool, but then this is just a dummy to create a chain. Because if I delete this tool, it goes away. Uh, oh, I guess the layer stays there. Never mind. Um, but you know. If you drag the volume fader on that chain or layer all the way to negative infinity, then when this thing is at full mix, it's effectively stopping all sound. It's effectively volume at zero, at negative infinity of whatever's moving through it. If you pull it all the way over here, it's completely unimpeded original volume of any audio signal that's moving through this. So uh, that's effectively what I've got over here is an FX layer with a layer that's got a tool in it. And it doesn't really matter what's inside it because all I wanted to use it for was to mute, right? So I have a muted layer. And then this uh, audio side chain is modulating the mix from all the way to full, which basically means this mute takes 100% effect and just mutes the signal entirely. So this is the, the cheesy workaround most of us have come up with to get around the limitation of tool itself, which um, unfortunately only goes to negative 36 dB, right? So we can't just automate the amplitude on tool if we want to get a full duck all the way to the floor. So instead, a lot of us just use this trick with an FX layer, have a single muted layer, or it works equally well if you simply delete the layer entirely and have nothing in here. If you have nothing in here, then when it's at full mix, nothing can pass through because there's there's literally no chains for the audio to pass through. But if the dry, if the mix is all the way over here, then the full dry signal is running through. Okay, so either way. So I have this going from full dry signal to full device signal, which in this case is empty. Nothing, not a floor, zero silence, okay? That's all that's going on here. Um, so in theory, this should be working the same way as my grid device. I have an audio sidechain that's pulling in signals from this impulse track. I'm, it's pretty much a broadband filter in this case because it's these are all such short signals, it doesn't matter. I wanna capture that, that little tick wherever it might be in the context of these signals. Um, so this filter is set up fairly high. Um, and then I'm pushing up the signal gain a little bit here just to get it strong enough. And then every time one of these impulses hit, it's going to crank it up and duck this track. So let's see what this looks like. We're not going to listen to sounds anymore. We're just going to look at what it looks like when we bounce. So let's do a bounce from about here to about here. We're gonna do a time bounce. So we click time and we do bounce. We're gonna do a 32-bit bounce for the best possible precision, no dithering, pre-fader, because I don't want the fader on this uh, white noise to affect what gets bounced. I wanna grab the signal before the fader. So when I hit okay, we're gonna get a new bounce track and let's take a look at it. All right, it kind of looks good, right? If we zoom in really close, especially on these two short ones, right about to there, we can see they're pretty precise, right? If I put my cursor there, that's pretty precise. If I put my cursor here, that's really precise. If we scroll over a little bit and look at this one again, it's pretty precise. You can see a little bit of a tail bleeding over the edge, but again, that's normal. That's what we would expect. We, we don't necessarily want a brick wall. And then, you know, there's a lot of signal because I'm kind of pumping the overall effect up with this gain knob. I'm basically making this signal much louder. So really this portion all the way through here 
is pretty much kind of coming up to zero dB. That's why we have that ducked all the way out to the floor. But then as it finally gets low enough, we see right about here, it's starting to fade back in again. And here's the release time, the kind of natural looking release time of the normal audio sidechain modulator, okay? And, and again, I have these attack and release times set at their fastest, which these only go down to one millisecond. And remember the grid device would go down to one tenth of a millisecond on each of these. So, but this is the fastest you can get out of here. All right, so, so far, so good. You, we could live with this, right? But here's the problem. Uh, let me get zoomed out enough, scroll over. Let's get a little more zoomed in. All right, here's the problem. Now we're gonna do a duck with the same exact settings on this audio sidechain. But first, I'm gonna come over here to the master track and I'm going to enable just the peak limiter. Remember, it's turned off. Right now, if we look at our, you know, where Bitwig shows you the delay on any given track, the plug-in delay compensation, there's no values anywhere. This is completely clean. But the minute I enable the peak limiter, we now have a 1.5 millisecond lag time from this peak limiter. And across the project, Bitwig has to do plug-in delay compensation, which normally works really well in most cases, but for some reason there's a bug with audio sidechain and you're gonna see it right now. I'm going to bounce this time span again. We'll just uh, grab this span of time, do another bounce. Blow it up a little bit, and let's let's actually put it below this one so we can see it better. All right. Now, if we look really, really close, we're going to zoom in and look at that. See that difference? Here's where the signal starts. Look at that lag. Look at that. The whole thing got shifted over. That's a 1.5 millisecond lag. That's what it's doing to the actual signal. Well, that's terrible, right? You might say, well, yeah, that's nothing, 1.5 millisecond. Most people aren't gonna hear that. Uh, except, and again, this is, this is across all of these impulses. If I zoom in on this one, it's the same exact thing here. See that lag? If I scroll over to this one, and we put our cursor at the start of that, see that lag? It's exactly the same. Everything's been shifted by the amount of the, of the total project delay, okay, from plugins. Um, so let's do this again, but this time we're going to turn on some more things on the master bus because, you know, projects end up getting laggy, especially during mastering and mixing phases when you're still going to be relying on your modulators and your automation lanes to do things like ducking for you and volume automation and things like that. So on my master track, uh, I've got my typical mix bus chain. Let's turn it on. Okay, here's, here's my typical mix bus chain today. I have EQs, I have compressors, I have mono shapers, and each one of these has things inside of them, right? Smart EQ, Golfos, two of my favorites these days. Um, I've got uh, an 1176 compressor, I've got a FabFilter Pro C2 compressor, I've got a Kramer Master Tape saturator, I've got a black box saturator, Vertigo saturator. I never run these at the same time, but I usually pick one of them, right? So that's like, my compression and saturation, mud clean. I've got some more analog style EQs, a FabFilter Pro MB. Maybe sometimes I use an Oxford inflator uh, after the end of all these or instead of some of these, right? But the point is a lot of these devices are creating some pretty significant plug and delay compensation. Look at this, just turning on my mix bus chain, my typical mix bus chain has added 249 milliseconds of latency to the project. And now watch what happens when I bounce this track. Again, we're gonna grab the same slice of time all the way to here. Maybe do a time bounce. And this is, this is just should blow your mind. I don't even have to pull it down. Look at what happened. These two ducks from these two impulses are way the fuck over here. What is that? That is ridiculous. And if I, I scroll over, this duck isn't even in this slice. It would be way over here somewhere if I had bounced that far out. So you see the problem? 
I'm sorry, if any of you Bitwig devs are looking at this, I know other people have reported this plug and delay compensation issue before with the typical, uh, one very typical intuitive, obvious use case for audio sidechain. Look at this, this is unacceptable. That is an unacceptable amount of, of lag. So you got a plug and delay compensation bug with, with audio sidechain and with note sidechain, and I, you really should fix it so we don't have to build our own workarounds in the grid to work around this problem. I don't know if you can do it in the grid, if you can make a, the plug and delay compensation work correctly in the grid, and in other use cases, like I showed at the very start of the video, you can make it work here and you should make it work here. So yeah, I love you Bitwig, you're my favorite DAW by far, but this is a bug, fix it. Okay, so I won't bore you with showing you that the same exact problem exists with the note, uh, the note side chain, but it does. Trying to do it with MIDI notes instead of audio signals is still gonna give you the same exact timing problem that I just demonstrated. So there you go. I've showed you there's a little bit of a problem with the way you may currently be doing your audio side chaining or even your MIDI note side chaining. There's some lag you may not be aware of. I wasn't aware of it until frankly, Admiral Bumblebee, thank you, Admiral, uh, did a, a bunch of videos recently about, you know, how your doll lies to you about, you know, things like a, an automation gate. Uh, I really recommend you search for Admiral Bumblebee on YouTube and pay attention to how if you're doing a simple thing like a volume gate like that, you would expect this kind of automation shape, which is a hard gated stepped automation from you know negative infinity to zero, you would expect it to just be brick walling the signal at those points, right? But Admiral shows you very clearly how every single DAW out there and most VST architectures out there don't really give you a brick wall. They purposefully smooth both the attack onset of this type of drop from zero to infinity, and then they have usually a much slower and longer rounded nonlinear kind of release for this shape. So you don't get this actual shape when you do a hard gate duck like this. You get something that's much different. And in most cases, it's designed differently for a reason and it's well done and it's good, right? You don't want hard brick walls, jumps up and down. You want a little bit of smoothing, but you want it to be very small. You want it to be just enough. And the problem is that every DAW does those shapes differently and doesn't really tell you it's doing that unless you zoom in really close and look at the resulting waveforms. And some of the DAWs are way out of line. like really ridiculously long attack and release uh, shaping and smoothing. So even for a hard cut like this. So just be aware that that exists and Admiral Bumblebee opened my eyes to it and, and a bunch of us in, in the Bitwig community. And that's when we started looking really close at how audio sidechain was working and found this lag thing that honestly, I had never thought to look for before. So this FX grid is a workaround for now. Um, at least when Bitwig 3.0 is officially dropped into production, which really should be soon now. We're up to beta 9 already. There's very few changes each beta now, so I think it's just around the corner, and you'll be able to take advantage of something like this real soon. Um, and you're going to want to until and unless the Bitwig devs decide that, yes, there is a problem with the plug-in delay compensation for audio sidechain and note sidechain, and they go fix it. And even then, well, you have a little bit of control over your envelope here, but there's slightly more fine control in here for certain things. So you may still like using a, a device like this anyway for audio ducking. Um, so that's it. Thank you for hanging with me. Hope this was useful and I'll see you next time.